it gives me great delight to welcome you all to the 2023 Kofi Annan Eminent Speaker Lecture. Every time that we hold this prestigious lecture, I have such warm memories of late Mr. Annan, the former UN Secretary General. He was such an incredible leader, a great mentor to me personally. His life was exemplary. His leadership was endearing and inclusive, and his wisdom, calmness, and thoroughness, and forthrightness always got all of us to reflect deeply on issues, question long-held assumptions on positions, all with our eyes focused on improving the conditions around the world. Whether it was the sustainable development goals, global uh, security issues, conflicts, global pandemics, food insecurity, governance, his voice will always resonate. Now, one of Kofi Annan's quotes that is up for today that I like very much says, and I quote him, we need to create a world that is equitable, that is stable, a world where we bear in mind that the needs of others and not only what we need matters immediately. We are all in the same boat. And he went on to aptly put it, one leak in the boat, and we all sink together. The challenges of our world today from COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, rising debt, food insecurity and conflicts are keeping the lead on development globally. The global development boat is leaking. And the consequences will be devastating unless we seal the leaking areas. At the top of the leakage is climate change, which poses existential risks for the world. We must do all we can to keep global warming at no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need innovations to power the world better with renewable energy. Another leakage, there's too much hunger in the world. It is not acceptable that over 2.3 billion people in the world go to bed hungry every single day. God did not create stomachs to go empty. He created them to be filled. There must be a hunger-free world. Another leakage, inability to cope with global health pandemics. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us how important it is to have global pandemic preparedness and to ensure no one is left behind in access to affordable health care. After all, all lives matter for the rich and for the poor. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently raised the alarm that the world is off course on meeting the Sustainable Development Goals, our SDGs, our collective agreement to shape a better world for all. A better world for 940 million people that are without electricity in the world. A better place for 3 billion people without clean cooking energy. The majority of those being women, with millions of the, and their children, die due to inhaling smoke from just trying to cook a decent meal that we all take for granted. A better world for 2 billion people without access to clean water and 4.5 billion people without access to sanitation. A better world for 1.7 billion people without access to basic finance, credit, savings, payments, or insurance. A better world, I must say, for 240 million children that are out of school, including 129 million girls. Yet, this is all happening in the midst of stupendous wealth in the world. Total assets under management by institutional investors will soon reach 1.145 trillion US dollars. Inequalities are expanding rapidly. Oxfam International put out a press release on the 13th of January of this year with a screaming headline. The richest 1% bag nearly twice as much as wealth as the rest of the world put together over the past two years. Just think about that. They continued. They grabbed nearly two thirds of all new wealth worth $42 trillion created since 2020. The challenge facing the world is therefore not lack of resources. It is that the resources are highly concentrated in developed countries with few extremely rich around the world 
while the world's development boat is leaking. The international community has a critical role to play to change this. Yet, as Kofi Annan reminds us in one of his statements, and I quote, the international community allows nearly 3 billion people, almost half of all humanity, to subsist on $2 or less a day in a world of unprecedented wealth. In Africa, development financing needs are huge and widening. The African Development Bank estimates that Africa needs a financing gap of $1.2 trillion through 2030 to finance the SDGs and to adapt to climate change. For example, the financing requirements for Africa's nationally determined contributions under the Paris Climate Agreement are estimated at $277 billion annually through 2030. Current flows of climate finance to Africa fall way short of that at just $30 billion in 2019 and 2020. Much of the available climate finance is concentrated in a few developed countries and very little is available in support of climate adaptation, which is of course Africa's most serious challenge. There is no doubt therefore that the global financial architecture is failing development in the world as it faces multiple global challenges. The global financial architecture needs to be reformed and transformed to tackle more effectively global challenges and to accelerate the achievement of sustainable development goals. We must ensure equal opportunities for all, regardless of one's economic, social, or racial background, we must create a level playing field for a more just, fair, and equitable world. Multilateral development banks like ourselves play a unique role of tackling global development challenges. By their nature, they are positioned to respond to global economic shocks, finance the needs of sustainable development goals, address rising fragility, and mobilize financing required to address climate change. It is estimated that the new global challenges will require a tripling of financing for multilateral development banks and a doubling of, uh, of bilateral aid, a significant increase in concessional lending and a massive increase, in particular, in inflows of private capital. The clarion call is from billions of dollars to trillions of dollars. The G20 has called for significantly raising the ambition of multilateral development banks, expanding resources for them to do more, improving their ability to take risk, optimizing their balance sheets, deploying more financial innovations and leveraging the private sector. Critically, they need to work collectively as a system to effectively deploy knowledge, risk mitigation instruments, and concessional financing at scale. And that's why we have selected the theme of the 2023 Kofi A. Annan Eminent Speaker Lecture to be the changing global financial architecture implications for multilateral development banks post-COVID-19. This topic is timely, and this lecture comes just a week after the World Bank IMF annual meetings in Marrakesh, Morocco, the first time in 50 years since the two global financial institutions held their annual meetings on the continent. A month ago also, the discourse on the global development financial architecture was at the heart of our discussions at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. There is, ladies and gentlemen, no better person to speak on this issue than our eminent speaker today, Dr. Jim Young Kim. Dr. Kim is a globally respected leader. He served as the 12th president of the World Bank Group from 2012 to 2019. He is currently the vice chairman and partner at the Global Infrastructure Partners, a fund that invests across the world in infrastructure. As president of the World Bank Group, Dr. Kim embarked on major reforms and shaped and reshaped, I must say, the vision of the bank to focus on two critical issues, ending extreme poverty and achieving shared prosperity. Under his incredible leadership, 
The World Bank invested heavily in education, in health, in pandemic prepared, uh, preparedness and prevention, and also on infrastructure. Dr. Kim served as the president of the Dartmouth College, United States of America, as professor in public health at Harvard University. And he was earlier a director at the World Health Organization. He co-founded what's called the Partners in Health, an NGO dedicated to health. He's well known for his pioneering work on the treatment of HIV AIDS, what they call the three by five initiative, which was acclaimed for being the first effort to globally tackle HIV AIDS. Beyond his global leadership and expertise, Dr. Kim is a great friend of Africa. As president of the World Bank, he prioritized Africa. Jim, of course, is a personal friend of mine. He and I traveled together, which we have the photos to show for it, uh, to Ghana, and we dressed, I think, my law, you were there then at that time in Ghana. We, we dressed in Kente dress as, as, as twin brothers uh, when we went to Ghana. Uh, uh, then was President John Mahama was president of Ghana. Jim epitomizes how multilateral development banks should work together. When I was seeking for general capital increase of the bank, uh, we traveled all the way to uh, Korea for that meeting, and I needed to get some support. Uh, Jim was president of the World Bank Group, got on a plane, and traveled all the way from, flew all the way from Washington to Korea. He came to Korea, Busan. He addressed all the shareholders. He made a very passionate case for the African Development Bank to get a, a general capital increase. And he said, well, I think he's actually doing quite a lot of reforms, more than I was doing at the, African, uh, at the World Bank, so you should give him more money. And of course, I was quite delighted. Uh, he finished the meeting, he got on his plane, and he flew right back to uh, Washington. And of course, our shareholders, eventually gave us that capital increase and just tells you a lot about the person. He showed commitment, commitment to Africa, commitment to working together instead of competing. And I cannot under, I need to underline that in the term of working as a system, but also a commitment to a friend. Jim walked the talk. He is eminently qualified to speak to us therefore today about how the global financial architecture needs to be reformed and how the multilateral development banks need to work together as a system. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my dear friend, our 2023 Kofi A and an eminent speaker, Dr. Jim Young Kim. Kim, over to you, Jim. Uh, it's great to be with you. Honored guests, uh, President Adeshina. Uh, I'm just in incredibly honored uh, to have been asked to give this lecture series uh, that honors uh, Kofi Annan. You know, I had the singular privilege of meeting uh, the Secretary General, uh, first through my work at the World Health Organization in scaling up AIDS treatment in Africa and uh, other developing countries. But then later, uh, after he retired, I was able to spend some quieter moments with him. You know, I've always thought that, that the Secretary General's role in bringing AIDS treatment to Africa has been woefully underappreciated. You know, it, it's even these days, uh, 20 years later, President George W. Bush is finally getting the kind of uh, acknowledgement that he deserves uh, with his presidential initiative. Uh, but I rarely hear about just how critical the Secretary General's role was, uh, especially in getting the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria started. It was the Secretary General Kofi Annan who, who uh, made that happen. And, uh, you know, putting my World Bank hat on, I really shudder to think what would have happened to the economy of Sub-Saharan Africa if we hadn't gotten the, the nearly 20 million people on treatment uh, who are getting treatment today. You know, my mother uh, was a scholar of Confucianism. She was a philosopher and studied Confucianism. And uh, Secretary General uh, Anand always reminded me of the great Confucian sages that she would tell me about, kind, compassionate, and wise beyond measure. Also, I want to thank uh, my good friend uh, Akin for those wonderful, kind words. You know, it was really uh, uh, such a breath of fresh air when he took over uh, as president of the uh, African Development Bank. Uh, we began working very closely together right away. And I'll never forget the very first panel I ever served on. I think 
Akina was at the uh, at the United Nations, and he started with just such a wonderful story. He told about the very first time he went to the United States. He landed in the wonderful town of West Lafayette, uh, Indiana, uh, the home of the great Purdue University, one of the greatest uh, uh, engineering uh, schools in the country. And uh, he rented a room uh, from a professor. And uh, every night, uh, he diligently ironed his shirts and ironed all his other clothes and, and uh, did it very early. Uh, and sometimes uh, even before he had dinner. So the matriarch of the household uh, one day, and this is the story, Akeem was telling the story uh, to, to, to the group. Uh, one day the matriarch of the family asked him, Akeem, why, why are you so um, diligent about every day coming home and ironing your shirts? And he said, well, I wanna get them ironed before the electricity goes out. And so the, the matriarch smiled and said, you know, here in West Lafayette, uh, the electricity tends to stay on uh, for, for most of the day. Uh, this son of a farmer from Nigeria uh, has come so incredibly far. Uh, and you know, uh, right after he spoke, I was able to speak. And what I said to him was, you know, King, you actually misunderstood the question. What she was asking you is why on earth would a graduate student iron his shirts? I, I'm, you know, having been a graduate student in the United States myself, I'm sure that uh, Akin was the only graduate student on the entire campus who uh, ironed his shirts ever. Uh, uh, you know, the, as, as you see, and as all of us uh, soon learn, uh, uh, President Adeshina is by far the best dressed multilateral development bank president in a long time. I think, in fact, uh, it goes all the way back to, uh, uh, to Bob McNamara. Bob McNamara was dressed almost as well is uh, Akin uh, with the bow ties, but he's by far uh, the best dressed and, and uh, uh, dare I say, best looking as well. So I, I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to do this with Akin. And uh, uh, generally speaking, when he asked me to do things, uh, the, the, the answer has always been yes. You know, um, when we were working together, one of the goals that we shared was the, the commitment to ending extreme poverty by 2030. And when I left the World Bank in 2019, we were making slow but really steady progress toward that goal. But of course, COVID, which I think we can now say was the worst disaster of the last century, uh, actually has put that goal probably out of reach. Uh, global GDP shrank by 4.3% in 2020. 70 million more people uh, were pushed into extreme poverty, an increase of, uh, of more than 11%. Now, just to give some perspective, uh, the spike in poverty was four times greater than the spike in poverty after the Asian financial crisis. But beyond the effects on mortality, economic growth, on uh, poverty, the impact on human beings, the impact on our reserve of, hu of human capital has just been devastating. Many of you may know that uh, in my last years at the bank, we started something called the Human Capital Project. By human capital, we mean simply the health, skills, knowledge, and experience that people accumulate over their lifetime. Uh, human capital has intrinsic value, but it also makes people more productive. It makes economies grow more quickly. It's basically wealth embodied in people, and for many of the poorest, it's the only wealth they have. Human capital accumulation is both sequential and cumulative. One stage builds on the previous stage, uh, and you have to invest in human capital over the entire life course. The most critical period of uh, human capital accumulation, of course, is when people are young. We started the uh, Human Capital Project uh, first to understand uh, what is the contribution of improvements in human capital to economic growth. And what we found, and it shouldn't surprise anyone, is that uh, human capital is one of the principal drivers of economic growth in developing countries. We then went on to quantify how countries were doing in building human capital so that we could compare them to one another. Now, you know, um, uh, comparisons and rankings are always controversial, but people pay attention. And the local press picks up on rankings uh, because they like to compare themselves to, to neighboring countries. So we started off our human capital index with, with very simple measures. Uh, uh, one was on education that focused on both quality and quantity. We called it learning adjusted years of schooling. 
Another uh, indicator was childhood stunting. Another was uh, uh, childhood under five mortality. And then finally, uh, we looked at adult mortality. The first index was published in 2018. Uh, the second in 2020, and because of COVID, uh, the next index has not come out yet, but it's still a very active ongoing project at the World Bank Group. And I suspect that there's work on the human capital index and the human capital project in other uh, multilateral development banks as well. Uh, did it work? Did it have its impact? Well, uh, let me just give you a couple of stories. So first, um, by the time the Human Capital Index came out, uh, my dear friend and now finance minister in Indonesia, Sri Mulyani Indrawati, she was in place as the finance minister. And I told her, you know, uh, Sri Mulyani, the childhood stunting rate in Indonesia is over 30%. She was shocked. Uh, of course, uh, you know, having worked at the World Bank and being such a brilliant person, she knew very well the implications of having a stunting rate over 30 percent. She was shocked. And so she put in place, along with President uh, Joko Widodo, an aggressive program to reduce childhood stunting. And between uh, 2018 and, and 2021, they reduced it by six points, uh, uh, results that we've seen in other countries as well. So in Indonesia, uh, that was one very specific example of how this ranking, how these numbers had a direct impact. Nigeria is another story, um, Akin's uh, home country. You know, we, uh, we were talking about the fact that the human capital indices in Nigeria were so low, despite the fact that Nigeria was, a, was an oil exporting country. And so um, uh, when the rankings came out, we knew that the uh, Nigerians were going to be very low in the bottom five of the ranking. And we were wondering what they would do. And uh, with other ranking systems, with other uh, indices, what we would hear from the lowest ranked countries is critique of methodology or critique of the of the uh, exercise in and of itself. But you know, something else happened. Uh, the vice president brought all the different ministers together and said, "Look, we've got to tackle human capital in a much more aggressive way." So uh, I, I think it did have some impact. But I, I would also say that. It's just really important to continue to monitor human capital because one, it's so important for economic growth, uh, but it's, it's, it's also, I think, uh, access to health and education is just a basic human right. So what was um, the impact of COVID on human capital? We have some idea. There are 14.9 million excess deaths, enormous psychosocial stress leading to spikes in mental illness, domestic violence, teen pregnancy, and early marriage in many parts of the world. Uh, the greatest impact, of course, is on young people. Uh, in early childhood, uh, we know that, that um, the first few years are really critical for brain development and that uh, the brain development during this time lays the foundation for literacy and uh, learn, the learning of mathematics. Uh, childhood stunting is so important uh, because when, some, when a child is, uh, is, uh, ha has, has a uh, two standard deviation uh, um, uh, uh, a lower height per age, uh, these are really very, very serious uh, um, uh, impediments to further learning. Nutrition got much worse. And in many countries, uh, the reports of uh, childhood, uh, the, 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 the reports of portions of food for children uh, 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 were really quite sobering. Uh, in Sierra Leone, 68% of children had smaller portions of food. In Kenya, 69% had smaller portions of food. And in Bangladesh, tragically, 100% of the children had smaller portions of food. Healthcare, uh, because of the lockdowns, very young children missed, uh, missed vaccinations. The percentage of unattended births went up. Many stopped going to preschool. Uh, uh, also, there were 75 million new orphans in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia because of parental deaths from COVID. Unprecedented stress in families created difficult home environments and uh, for, uh, the, the direct declines uh, in um, testing of toddlers, for example, uh, lagged far behind um, in Bangladesh. The difference between toddlers in 2022 and 2019 uh, were frighteningly large. Uh, the observed uh, changes in healthcare uh, in uh, in learning, in schooling, in childhood stunting, et cetera, uh, if not remedied, could translate into as much as a 25% reduction in earnings when these children uh, are adults. What about school-aged children? 
So in, among school-aged children, more than 1.3 billion children lost at least six months of schooling due to COVID. In wealthy countries, the switch was made quickly to online learning. And we're, we're, we're finding out that even though uh, uh, the vast majority of children in uh, OECD countries had access to the internet, there were still um, uh, losses in learning. But in, in a world where two thirds of children in the world do not have access to the internet in the home, you can uh, only imagine uh, how poorly that switch to online learning went in, uh, in developing countries. Learning losses, losses happened at all income levels. Uh, one day of school closure led to one day of loss of learning, except among the poorest countries and in the poorest households. Because not only did they lose that year of learning, but they forgot the things that they uh, learned before. So they went back even further, and therefore inequality in loss of learning got worse. School dropouts were also a major issue. The poorer the household, the more likely the young person would be not to return to school. What about in older uh, uh, youth, in, in youth from 15 to 24 years old? Well, there were deep employment losses, and there were differences in both the percentage of unemployed and the rapidity of reemployment after COVID. And of course, the poorer the country, the poorer the household, the worse the outcome. Uh, the so-called NEET, N-E-E-T, not in education, employment, or training, that number went up very high, uh, uh, very much in developing countries. In OECD countries, what often happened is that uh, when restaurants closed or when other places of work closed, uh, young people took the opportunity and with the, with the amounts of stimulus uh, 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 financing, the, 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 the um, fiscal spending that um, uh, you saw in so many of the different countries, they use that money to get training in other fields or to continue their education. Of course, in developing countries, what you what you found is that people fell into the neat category, not in education, employment, or training. And of course, this is further erosion of human capital. Now, if we can get uh, the first slide up. So the first slide, I, I just want to pay tribute to uh, my colleagues uh, and my 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 friends at the uh, uh, at the World Bank Group. They published this wonderful. Um, a study called Collapse and Recovery. This is the cover of it. And if we can go to the second slide. Uh, the second slide shows that in order to get back to the trajectory for human capital development, the countries that were on before COVID, children will have to learn more each year than they would have before COVID. This is extremely difficult. Excuse me. Okay, now we got, and, and let's go to the next slide. Right, so this slide, shows that in order for the uh, for countries to get back to the trajectory for human capital development that they were on before COVID, they're gonna have to learn more each year than they would have before COVID. This is gonna be difficult. It's gonna be more difficult uh, for the poorer countries. And, and so how do you get there? How do you uh, take uh, educational systems that may have been struggling before and get them to perform at even higher levels? Well, you know, the, the measures are well known to anyone working in the multilateral development bank system, transfers for the poorest households, catch up campaigns for vaccinations and nutrition. And there are some countries that have done quite well um, in terms of uh, uh, catch up. Pakistan, for example, has done quite well in uh, uh, catching up on vaccines. Parenting programs to encourage more cognitive and social emotional stimulation. These are these so called ECD, early childhood development activities. We need more of those. There has to be restored and expanded pre-primary uh, education, mental health counseling uh, for, for both parents and children. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this is uh, in the, the, the study, um, uh, Collapse and Recovery. We have lots of good evidence-based uh, approaches uh, to recovering the lost uh, education, the lost um, human capital during COVID. Uh, responses like, as I said, cash transfer, preschools, vaccination, uh, keeping schools open longer, streamlining curricula to help kids catch up, uh, learning assessments, alleviating financial uh, constraints, training programs for the uh, uh, older uh, uh, set of young people, conditional cash transfer programs to encourage younger ones to stay in school. All of these activities uh, have been proven uh, to be helpful. Now, if we can go to the final slide. So, in, in the context of this need to now 
quickly, aggressively go back on the path of building back human capital. Uh, my colleagues at the World Bank, I think, make a, 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 a great argument uh, for the new systems to be much more integrated, uh, that policies and activities could be integrated, should be integrated across sectors. And these new systems should be agile, resilient, adaptive. Uh, they should always reach the most vulnerable. And the systems themselves should have the mandate and authority to coordinate across all the sectors, resolve conflicts, be data-driven, and be better than they were before COVID. Now, I think th this is a wonderful report. I think these are wonderful recommendations. But then uh, what is the role of multilateral development banks? I just think there's no way to get around uh, the, uh, the, the realization that um, there really are not great market-based solutions to solving uh, the problems uh, of lost human capital from COVID. Uh, the MDBs are going to have to step up. And um, also, uh, I think that compared to the UN system, the UN system institutions, of course, are wonderful. I've worked in them myself. But they are, they, they do tend to be very focused in, you know, the World Health Organization focus on health, uh, UNESCO and others focus on education. It's very difficult uh, for those organizations to think system-wide. And I think the multilateral development banks and the African Development Bank in particular uh, are especially well-placed to think about building those uh, overall systems. And, and I, you know, I think that, um, uh, again, from all the research that we've done in the Human Capital Project, it's clear that investing in human capital is going to be a very powerful driver of economic growth, uh, at least in the medium and long term. Now, what about the traditional focus on infrastructure? Well, you know, the multilateral development banks will always have an important role to play. But let's just take a look at what kind of scale we're talking about, you know, how, how we're going to be able to meet the needs uh, going forward. So um, uh, President Adeshina has talked a little bit about, you know, what, what's needed. The number I've heard is that uh, finance needed for uh, just climate-related uh, uh, activities in uh, developing countries is uh, is total of two trillion. I think um, uh, uh, Akin said there was uh, one point two in Africa. So if you look at 2019 and 2020, there was a total of 30 billion of climate finance that came into uh, to Africa, and of that, only four billion came from the private sector. Now we know, we know, we know, we know that we have to have much more of uh, finance and coming from the private sector flowing into Africa. But starting at 30 billion, when much more is needed, and then only 4 billion of that coming from the private sector, uh, what are the prospects of uh, reaching the levels that we need to reach? So uh, in the process of trying to, 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 as we say, crowd in private sector capital, I, I think uh, the African Development Bank has done some really innovative, exciting things. The synthetic securitization program uh, that transferred some of the non-sovereign loan books to the private sector, wonderful creative program. With the support of the UK, I, I, I've heard of the risk transfer uh, transaction uh, of the of sovereign debt of, all, of almost uh, US $2 billion uh, to support with scaling, uh, um, scaling up uh, climate finance, wonderful. At new asset classes, great initiatives. And um, I, I, you know, maybe uh, I, I thought I would just take the final few minutes of, uh, of my talk uh, to kind of report back. So, you know, uh, I'm a multilateral development bank person. I, 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 I you know, grew up in some very significant ways in that system. So um, uh, some of you may know, I have also, I also have a PhD in anthropology. So let me just give you maybe an anthropologist report of what I found now being out in the private sector, uh, trying to bring that money into our particular fund. My, my fund inside the company I work with is an emerging market infrastructure fund. Uh, the group I work for uh, is Global Infrastructure Partners, and it's uh, it was founded by um, a countryman, fellow countryman of, uh, of uh, Akin's, uh, a gentleman by the name of Adebayo uh, Ogunlesi, uh, probably the most brilliant human being I've ever met. He built this company from nothing, over $100 billion in assets under management, and uh, the original idea behind the fund was to invest to, to a great extent in uh, uh, emerging markets. But they were so successful in OECD countries that they kept investing uh, in, in those countries. And by the time they uh, were able to turn around and sort of saying, OK, what about our emerging market structure? Their funds were so large uh, that, that they had outgrown the size of investments that could be made in emerging markets. So 
um, uh, I was recruited. My friend uh, Jin Yong Sai, who was head of IFC, uh, we joined and we went about trying to raise money for the Emerging Market Infrastructure Fund. And you know, this is now uh, we're, we're working for a company that has 100 billion uh, assets under management, incredibly successful. Here are the questions we got: What about currency risk? Is it expensive? To hedge currency risk in emerging markets? What about all the various forms of political risk? What about rule of law? How do we know governments won't nationalize assets? What's the premium you'll offer in terms of return in order to justify the much higher risk we're taking by investing in emerging markets? The number we heard most often was, you have to offer us at least a 5% IRR premium for us to even consider investing in your fund. Will local investors allow you to make any money? Do you have boots on the ground? How well do you know these countries? So um, uh, what what we learned was that it's difficult, and it's been it's been uh, um, uh, I'd say a little bit unsettling and and discouraging to see how many uh, misconceptions there are about the situation uh, in developing countries. And so uh, you know we learned some really hard lessons. For example, uh, when I was at the World Bank, we had many meetings on impact investing. And I was told by various people, oh, there are trillions of dollars waiting uh, uh, for, for opportunities to do impact investing. I can tell you at the level of the CIO, the chief investment officer and below, where allocation decisions are made, there's there's tremendous amount of skepticism about impact investing. And lest you think that the skepticism is coming from just from hard-hearted billionaire bankers, uh, most of the negative responses came from uh, really public employees who ran these pension funds. And what they told me was this. They said, look, uh, we understand what you're saying. We understand um, uh, your passion. You, we understand why impact investing is important. But we cannot take the chance of uh, failing to build the pension plans of teachers, uh, police, firefighters in order uh, to invest in some unproven notion of impact uh, for people in in a far off land. This is this is what we this is what we've been hearing uh, all too frequently. But look, there's also great news. There are wonderful opportunities. Uh, uh, the the countries that we're investing in are growing rapidly. There are wonderful opportunities in Africa. But we're going to have to do a lot more and a lot more together to realize the promise of bringing the kinds of private sector funds that Africa deserves. You know, uh, my dream is that someday we'll make these investments. Uh, we, the investments will have such a positive impact on economic growth uh, that the returns will be very strong for investors, uh, but the countries will have grown so much as a result of these investments uh, that everyone is happy. Once we have that sort of situation, the investors will come pouring in and the virtual virtuous cycle will go forward. I hope that this that that um, uh, someday very soon, all of us together can celebrate that. Uh, uh, people, uh, groups like GIP, the Global Infrastructure Partners, private investors, the African Development Bank, and uh, 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 people in the developing countries themselves. One day soon, I hope we can we can celebrate this virtuous cycle that brings to Africa what it needs but more importantly, brings to Africa what it deserves. Thank you very much. Well, my brother and friend, uh, thank you very much. That was a fantastic. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and you look cool too. Uh, hey, I, I, like I, I wore my best suit. I wore my best. I wore my best suit and my best tie, but I still look so shabby compared to you. <laughs> well, thank you for a phenomenal lecture, and thank you for the insights that you gave us, uh, a lot, Jim. And I just wanted to to say a few words about where you started off in terms of human capital. Uh, human capital is the basis for everything. Um, otherwise, we will all not be here. Uh, education matters, skills matters, uh, institutions matter, and how we finance education um, is a big it's a big issue. And and the point that you raised about a lot of kids that you know, came out of school or fell out of school because of COVID. It's an issue that we have to recreate again, get kids back into school and also make sure they have fantastic um, uh, infrastructure to, to support learning. And when one thinks about education, one of the things that I think about is, 
you know, how do we better link that education to the skills of the marketplace? You know, we've got today um, 477 million young people that are between the age of age of 15 and, 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 and 35. Um, and in Africa today, we have a challenge in terms of a third of those are not employed, a third of those are on, underemployed, and a third of them are simply mad with governments. Okay, so I think that issue of, yes, we invest in education, but also we've got to invest to make sure that we reduce the skills mismatch between what the educational systems produce and what the needs of the labor markets uh, actually have. And the second one, of course, is that we often emphasize, and perhaps way too much, uh, just formal education uh, in, in the sense of going to um, uh, uh, universities and all of that. Um, I think if one looks at uh, uh, experiences of places like Germany and so on, where you have a lot of industrial development, they focus a lot on technical and vo vocational training. And, and that's why for us as a bank, we are investing quite heavily um, in, in tech uh, a technical and vocational uh, uh, training. That's uh, a very, very uh, uh, important. Um, and just to tell you also that I think we need to also make sure that we create financial facilities that support young people. Um, they've gone to school, they come out of school, um, but where are they going to get the capital to set up their businesses? You know, and 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 sometimes I feel I feel that young people go to technical vocational education, they finish all of that at the end of it, they come out and so what? You know, then you you train me some more, but there's no finance for me to go set up my business. And and I wanted just to share with you an experience that I had with. Our common friend, um, President uh, uh, Kagame, and, and, and you were there. What's the name of that? Your school again in uh, uh, the, the Global Health University? University of Global Health Equity. Yeah, and, and, and many of you may not know, University of Global Health Equity is, is the chancellor of that university. It's based in, uh, in Kigali. And he was telling me earlier this morning, uh, this afternoon when we're talking that in the, in the rankings that he gave, I think it came fifth. I think he said... Is it global? Uh, whatever it was, eight. Well, eight. The, eight. Yeah, the London eight. Times higher education ranking it came out eight. eight Perhaps go work to do, Chancellor. So, uh, but but I wanted to tell you about an important point of this issue of financing for young people. Um, President Kagame told me that um, we haven't we supported something in Kigali called the Kigali Institute of Science and Technology. And I went to see him, and and this is a program where we put in forty million dollars. They have scholarships. They support kids, to, I mean, uh, students to go to school. And then one day he said he was jogging um, at about 8.30 at night uh, in Kigali, and there was a young lady jog jogging the opposite direction and wanted to say, hi, Mr. President. And of course they pushed her uh, aside. And she said, no, 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 Mr. President, you sent me to the Kigali Institute of Science and Technology, uh, which is a program that we have, I think with, with Carnegie Mellon, I think we, it's a joint program. Yeah. yeah, and I want to tell you what I'm doing now, what I want to plan to do. And he said, okay, bring her. And uh, she came uh, uh, you know, along and uh, he then asked her to come to the state house and when it stays the house and he said he gave her a little bit of money, a uh, so small amount of money just to encourage her and that's okay. And, and she went and she said, I never saw her again for more than two and a half years. And after that, she came back one day and, and called and they let her into the state house. Want to see the president. She said, Mr. President, the business that you supported me to do just about three years ago, I just sold it. I developed it and I sold it uh, for $21 million. And she's 27 years old. And of course, I told President Kagame, please, can you please tell all African heads of state to jog at 8.30 at night and make sure that he invests in health, in education for, for young people. So, Really, your point there is really fantastic. I also want to uh, emphasize what you said about malnutrition with a practical example. You know, I remember when you and I and um, and uh, Bill Gates, you remember we were uh, talking about investing in uh, gray matter infrastructure, where the issue is not just about infrastructure. We can, we, we can build roads, we can build rail, we can build ports and so on. If they're bad, we can fix them. But... I remember that conversation you and I had about the neurons. And I remember you pulled out some documents for me at that time to, to look at how neurons work. That if you actually have those things affected, you can repair them. And so and that's where, you know, that, that came up with our issue of let's invest in gray matter infrastructure. And a practical example, Jim, I wanted to give you is, you know, I went to Madagascar in 20, uh, GDA, what was it, 2017? What was it, 16? There about. And when I arrived, we went on an helicopter. We got to this particular village, and there was this all these kids that were excited. They ran towards the uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the 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 chopper, 
And my eye just fi got fixated on one kid, one little kid. Seems to be a little bit more exuberant than others. And um, I, I bent down and I said, what, what's your name? And, and he told me uh, 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 his name. But what surprised me was the voice that was projected. Because I thought this kid was just couldn't be more than uh, five years old. So my name is Anthony, but I, the voice was so strong. I said, how old are you? He's an 11-year-old kid. But so stunted. So you can imagine when Dr. King was talking about the impact of what stunting does. I think for our economies, we lose anything between 5 and 11% of our GDP as a result of, uh, of stunting. And I asked him, um, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he said he wants to be a doctor just like you, okay, and so on. So I, I said, okay, uh, there's no way you're going to be a doctor at this particular age if you, with this level of stunting. So I pick up my phone and I call my wife and call Grace, your friend. So I say, Grace, um, I'm in front of this kid. This kid is stunted, severely stunted. And there's just no way this kid can be anything with this level of stunting that you have. You are giving the statistics about what was done in Indonesia and all of that. And I said, can we adopt this kid? And of course, the line went dead. And I said, honey, are you there? He said, yeah, I'm there. You can go ahead and adopt the kid. And so we did. Well, Anthony today, he just passed his exams. He's going to university now. He's, high, he's taller than myself. Yeah. <laughs> and he wants to be a doctor just like Dr. Kim. I'm just trying to say that about the importance of what you raised in making sure that we get resources, not just for education, but very early you know, education. And one thing I also say is about girls. You and I, well, you know very well the, the, the point about early, early marriages and how that affects girls in school. I think so. Those are points that I, I just want to say. And, and two points I made before we open it up. Um, you talked about the um, issue of the, uh, the COVID. And Dr. Kim is so right because I think the COVID situation has is very well explained it created divergences between developed countries and developing countries. And we're still coping with that, uh, even, even today. And of course, for us in Africa, Jim, we still have a tapering effect of about $435 billion a year that we need to cope with all those effects that, that, that you were talking about. And then on top of that, now we got climate change. On top of that, now we got conflict, we got inflation, we got debt, we got all those things. Like when it rains, it just, it just pours. And so all the more reason why the global financial architecture needs to deliver a lot more financing for, for Africa, uh, concessional financing, a lot to deal with issues of debt, issues of climate, issues of health, all those things that you um, very well uh, uh, mentioned in your, uh, in your point. And the last thing I just wanted to say is um, uh, the issue of getting private sector in. Um, you're spot on because, as I said in my opening remarks, um, Africa has about, let's say, $2 trillion of assets under management. Globally, we still have about close to $145 trillion of those assets under management. But when we say we want to attract that, I think a number of things you're clear, clearly right needs to be done right. First is, where are the projects? Uh, which projects are we going to be financing? So a lot needs to be done in developing bankable projects. And you're working in infrastructure firms, so, so that's important. Second is the risk. You know, and I always feel that risk in most cases, sometimes it's like um, people stand out there and they make perceptions of risk elsewhere that they don't understand, right? And you cannot really assess things unless you actually have an understanding of that market. Um, and, 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 and I remember when I was learning how to swim and, and uh, 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 you know, they told me that it, the end of the pool was the most risky part and that I was gonna sink, I was so scared. But when I went to the deep end of the pool, Jim, I found that it was the, the easiest part of the pool was the, the deep end of the pool. So if you know your, your neighborhood, I don't think you'll be so scared uh, uh, of, of risk. And um, I think the talking of data, look at, we did something, I think it was Moody's analytics that we asked to look at the, the, the risk of default on infrastructure financing globally. And Africa has the lowest level of default globally. right? So I'm making that because I think there's a difference between the real risks, there's also the difference between the passive risk. I think the passive risk for Africa is high. And as a result, Africa pays today about 700 basis points higher in terms of what you call the Africa premium in terms of being able to, uh, to, to generate much financing. But anyway, thank you very much, uh, 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 my, my friend, uh, for those very stimulating uh, points that you raised. And I think that 
your point on multilateral development bank, yes, we have to work better as a system. Uh, we have to make sure we deploy our capital better. Um, and we need more capital, um, but I would say we need more, also callable capital, but paid in capital because you need risk capital to be able to leverage a lot of the private capital that you were talking about. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jim. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. President, for that. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Kim, but I've got to say earlier on, we had how Dr. Kim, as the president of the World Bank Group, flew to Busan in Korea to join the African Development Bank Group's annual meetings. And at that time, this is what Dr. Kim said. Um, I want you to know that there's no way we are going to achieve what Africa deserves without a stronger African Development Bank, the continent that deserves so much and deserves precisely what a bigger, better, more efficient, more effective African Development Bank can deliver. In 2019, that came to pass with an increase in the, uh, in, in the capital increase of the bank. So the question here is, uh, Dr. Kim, the bank is preparing to celebrate its 60th anniversary next year, is Diamond Jubilee. What's your advice as to where the bank should be in the next decade? Well, I, you know, I, I um, uh, of course, defer to everyone there and uh, know more about it than I do. But he here's just a few thoughts. Um, I, I thought it was extremely bold uh, for um, uh, for President Deshna to to go forward with the um, uh, capital increase. I thought it was, first of all, a great idea, uh, which is why I, I flew all the way to, to, to Busan. Uh, but also I went there. Um, and, and although you know it was the board, it was not it was not necessarily Korea. But I wanted to, in the country of my birth, go there and give a personal testimony to the great faith that I had in him as an individual and the African Development Bank as an institution. I think the African Development Bank needs even more capital, right? So as I'm as I'm out there looking at sort of the various instruments in the world that are trying to tackle things like loss of human capital. Um, as a result of uh, of COVID and the infrastructure deficit uh, in, uh, in in Africa, you know the lack of uh, energy uh, in uh, in Africa still, there is no better bargain for the world than to invest in the multilateral development banks. I mean, you know the the um, uh, the, the the formula is really very simple, and and you know the way that we uh, educated um, our constituents when we were going for the for the uh, uh, capital increase at the World the World Bank was look for every billion dollars of uh, paid in capital, uh, the bank can can lend a billion dollars each year uh, with long tenors and low interest rates. This is the best bargain that you can possibly have, and I think it's really critical for multilateral development banks to not be shy about um, uh, teaching the world that of all the things you can put your money into, putting a billion dollars into an MDB will let you uh, uh, multiply the impact of that billion dollars over and over and over again. So I think, first of all, just you know, be even bolder than before, right? Um, I, I think the next question is, so how do you work closely with the private sector? How do you use these innovative tools to, to crowd in uh, capital? So, you know, let, let me just give you a couple examples. So, um, we started working on things like project preparation facilities, right? And the project preparation facilities, uh, it, it, you know, people say, well, you know, you need, you need bankable projects, so let's create a project preparation facility that's a group of people that work at the multilateral development banks. But the thing is, the kind of project preparation that's done by people who are not professional investors who are doing this all the time is not the same as what we do inside Global Infrastructure Partners. I, ha I have to tell you, you know, um, among the most, um, uh, 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 what's the right word? Uh, 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 among the most intense, the most intellectually challenging, the most stimulating meetings I go to are our investment committee meetings. Uh, the kinds of questions that are asked are so incredibly difficult. I mean, we usually start off with a question. Um, well, so if this is such a great investment, why are these people selling it? So, so you know, the, the kind of work that, that's, that's uh, required to get past any reasonable, decent investment committee is very complicated. And so uh, for, the, for the multilateral development banks, uh, having to go in and work with 
the MDBs over a long period of time going through the project preparation project uh, process of an MDB, it usually is not going to work. On the other hand, if there are sort of, um, uh, what's the right word, sort of easily digestible uh, tools, uh, like, for example, first loss facilities or um, you know credit enhancement or other things that don't slow the whole process down, uh, then I think multilateral development banks can play a hugely important role. What I'm hearing now, and I, you know, I think my my friend Ajay Banga uh, gave a great speech. I think he's going to be a great World Bank president, and he uh, said directly that he's going to go and ask for more capital. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, most important constituents, I think, said, "Great, we're agreeing with this. We agree with the vision, uh, but just no more capital." I, I I just don't think that is going to work. So uh, more capital. Uh, uh, figure out ways of working with the private sector that that are are so user friendly uh, that um, that that the dream that we've always had that private sector capital will come rushing in because the World Bank uh, and the African Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Bank uh, all these different banks just make it almost irresistible uh, to invest in emerging markets. That is not happening yet. Right. Um, you know, let's let's try to find projects where we actually do that. Uh, you know, I, I've been obsessed with uh, the possibility of building the Grand Inga Dam forever uh, just because, you know, there's a possibility uh, that, um, uh, you know, we could double the um, uh, the access to electricity in, in the continent. And, you know, uh, of course, there are environmental concerns, but, you know, over 90 percent of all potential hydroelectric power plants in the United States are already built and already functioning. And in Africa, it's around 1%. You know, I, 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 I think that, you know, um, this, is a, this is one area where we, we can explore. Is there a way for us to build a consortium with the African Development Bank at the center, uh, uh, build a consortium that can get a project like that done? So complicated, so requiring of uh, of a of a really broad um, uh, efforts at uh, at at having governance that will work in a situation like that. You know, if we could make that happen, that would be transformative. So, I you know, again, I'm a huge believer in the MDBs. I think the MDBs should be you know screaming it at the top of their lungs that uh, in, in, invest in the MDBs, and that's where you're going to have the biggest possible impact. But you know. Let's make it work. Let's make it work with the private sector. I would like you all to kindly join me um, in really thanking um, the, the, the African man across the screen uh, 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 from me. Um, you know, he has a heart for, for Africa. Uh, he has shown incredible uh, uh, leadership uh, when he was at the World Bank. Um, he continues to, even at the Global Infrastructure Partners, continue to look for ways to just explain the issue of Inga, ways in which we we'll continue to support Africa. Um, he is a friend of the African Development Bank. Uh, Jim, I can never forget what you did for me uh, when I was looking for general capital. You are my friend for life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.